Food and Drug Administration Commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who is actually here on set with us today. Dr. Gottlieb, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Um, first of all, just want to ask you about the romaine lettuce recall. Nobody ate salad over Thanksgiving because all the romaine lettuce in the entire country was recalled. It, it was pretty unprecedented. Do you have any better idea of what happened or where the breakdown occurred? Yeah, it was a tough time to take that action um, right before the holiday. We've isolated to California. We'll probably have an announcement later today in the region where in, where in California we think it's uh, coming from. Um, and we're also going to make an announcement today about an agreement we've struck with the industry to uh, label all future romaine for where it's grown and the date in which it was harvested. I think that's going to help cut down on these very broad kinds of recalls or withdrawals. We'll be able to target them better in the future and also do better track and trace. Is the industry on board with it, given what they just went through, where every yeah. bit of romaine got thrown away throughout the entire country? That's a good part of it, I think. I think, you know, recognizing that we had to do this broad type of market withdrawal. You know, at this point in the time, all the romaine that's on the market is from California, because that was the only region that's harvesting. But Florida's going to be looking to harvest. Yuma's going to be looking to harvest. And without packaging that says when those products were harvested and where they're harvested from, it might be hard for them to re-enter the market. So by putting that on the packaging is going to be make, it, make it easier to purge the market and then restock the market. Can you pinpoint down even within California where it was coming from? We think we have. Uh, we think we know the region within California where the outbreak's coming from. But we're looking at what we're doing is tracing back isolated cases, individual people, not clusters right now. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's less reliable. I think by later today we'll be able to announce the region within California. But most of that products now off the market. California already harvested. That was the product that was on the market. That's the product that's been withdrawn. Now the market's going to be restocked with product coming online probably from Florida and Yuma, different regions. I mean, this was something that was a long time coming. These people were getting sick at the beginning of October. Is there a way to kind of uh, fast track the process and, and, and pinpoint more, more quickly? This was quick. I mean, we had, a, if you remember last Christmas, we had an outbreak I of do. illness associated with lettuce as well. And we didn't, we didn't say it was romaine, the Canadians did, but that we found out about that so late in the season, the product was out of the market. Why we, why we issued the advice we did before the holidays is because we were earlier in the process, so we were able to actually affect you know, more people becoming impacted. So we're getting better at this, but I think having information on the labeling that's going to identify where the product's from is going to make it easier to pull it off the market. Do we have the right laws in place to deal with this? We have broad there's new authorities. Some, but there's been some debate about, about clean water in certain places. Things like that. Right. So there's a lot of new authority that we have. We're putting in place agricultural water rules. So I think we've gotten a lot better. What we don't have are all the tools to do effective track and trace in the system. Um, we have a guy starting today, the former head of food safety at Walmart, who's going to be coming to FDA hmm. um, to help us put, put in place, among other things, better track and trace, using tools like blockchain maybe to even do track and trace in the food supply chain. Commissioner Gottlieb, uh, just last week, the FDA made some announcements about different rules for medical devices, different safety uh, rules and guidelines going forward. Makes a lot of sense because when you recall a medical device, it's a lot harder than a car recall. This is something that's implanted in right. someone's body. Uh, what are these new rules? What do they come about? And w what's the point? Well, la last week we announced some new rules around safety, some new efforts we're making around trying to ensure device safety, do better post-market surveillance, active surveillance of medical devices in the marketplace. And, you know, declared that FDA in the U.S. should really be the first regulatory agency in the world to be able to spot a safety signal among world regulators. Today we're making another major announcement about a really uh, significant modernization of the device approval process. A lot of devices come to market by basically demonstrating that they're substantially equivalent to an existing device, but they use as a predicate the device that they're comparing themselves to, a device that's sometimes many decades old. What we're saying now is we're going to make it easier for device companies to establish new predicates to use as standards for approval. But we're also going to be looking to retire some of the older predicates that companies have been using as a basis for their approval. That's a big change. Um, are these predicates no longer on the market? Or are they not Sometimes really they're no longer used? on the market. So when the law was put in place in 1976, Congress basically froze all the existing devices and said these devices that are currently on the market can serve as predicates for future approvals. You can compare yourself. That's more than 40 years ago. It's been completely changed. So what we want to do is constantly try to push the market in the direction of incorporating better technology, better capabilities by advancing the predicates and always looking forward so that the, the sort of complement of predicates that device companies are using as the basis for their approvals are constantly incorporating newer and better technology to make the devices better and safer. Is the risk, I'm just trying to think of the downside to doing something like that, is the risk that you are dealing with predicates that don't have a long history in the market, don't have, let's say, a decade's worth of experience or a decade's worth of scientific studies that you can follow these things on? Well, the newer devices have a lot of safety 
um, capabilities and better technology built in. You, if you're looking at a predicate that's been on the market for 10 years, that's a lot of experience. I think the concern is going to be on the side of the industry where they're going to say, well, all these products that are currently on the market got to get to the, they got to the market by comparing themselves to older devices. It might have been easier. Now it's going to be harder for us. So there's going to be some concern that it could be raising the standards huh. for approval, making it a little harder. I don't see it that way because if you're bringing a new technology to the marketplace and you compare yourself to a technology that has more capabilities, you're going to come to market with a better label and it's going to make you more competitive. And sometimes it's harder to bridge to those old predicates than it would be to bridge to a new predicate that more closely approximates what your device is doing. You know, we have, for example, x-ray equipment coming to market that has a lot of new capabilities, but they're still comparing themselves to an x-ray machine that was on the market in 1980 sure. that emitted a lot more radiation. Uh, let's talk a little bit about drug prices, because that's been a huge focus for the president. It's been a huge focus for you, too. Uh, Pfizer just came out and basically said it's going to go back to raising prices in 2019. That's Ian Reid kind of sin signaled that in the latest uh, conference call that he held. We saw drug prices kind of hold steady, Pfizer in particular, saying that they would not raise uh, drug prices while they were kind of negotiating with the administration and with the president about what to do going forward. What, what do you think happens? Is, is this something that can be addressed? Is it going to be a problem? Well, if you look at what's actually happening in the marketplace across the board, the overall rate of inflation in the drug sector, the branded drug sector, has been largely flat. So drug prices overall have flattened out. Obviously, some individual companies are taking price increases on selected products, but a lot of the generic competition that's coming into the market um, is really depressing the overall inflation. Now, prices haven't come down. You haven't seen price cuts, but you haven't seen the kind of 5 and 6 percent inflation overall across the market that we were seeing year over year. Last week, the Wall Street Journal had an op-ed that actually directly tied that to things that you've been doing at the FDA, just in terms of allowing new competition, making it easier for, for, for new competition to come in, particularly in orphan drug markets. Uh, they said you've saved billions of dollars by doing that. Well, we've, we've increased the rate of generic uh, entry into the marketplace. So the, the Wall Street Journal uh, commented on a study that was done by the Council of Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett's team at the White House. Um, I think it was they, they estimated that we've increased the number of generic approvals on a monthly basis by 18% mm -hmm. over the 20 months that we've been working at this, um, saving about $26 billion. So the pace of generic approvals has gone up, and that has had some impact on the overall spending on drugs. I have two questions. One, relating back to Pfizer, uh, clearly Ian Reid had been given a talking to by the president about freezing, the, freezing prices through the end of this year. How much do you think that actually had an impact on, on the freeze and the decision to then raise them afterwards? And yeah, I'm just not privy to those discussions, so I don't know what... And do you what, think it had anything to do with the midterms? I, I haven't been involved in those discussions, so I don't know what, what Ian Reid's calculating. Um, and then the other question I was going to ask is, the other report that happened in the Wall Street Journal last week was this uh, report of a tie-up in terms of uh, equity stakes between Walgreens and Humana and how you think about transactions like that. Well, I think when you, when you look at what's <coughs> happening with the, the vertical integration in the marketplace, the whole idea of the PBM is the middleman's changing and the rebates that get paid to the PBM and the PBM then passes on to the health plan. Now the PBM is going to be owned by the health plan, so that whole rebating scheme is going to look a lot different because you're effectively going to be rebating to yourself. You know, my, my experience in healthcare generally is vertical integration hasn't worked out well for a lot of different sectors in healthcare. We'll see if it works out better for these Will it guys. work out for the customer, though? Um, remains to be seen. I think some of, the, some of the consolidation we've seen in the marketplace, sometimes it provides new opportunities to customers, but a lot of times it creates fewer choices and less competition. All healthcare is local, remember. So if you get rid of local competition in healthcare, you can drive up local prices a lot. But so when you read a headline like that, do you go, ugh, I wish they weren't doing that? Or you go, oh, this is the way, this, this is what we need to happen? Hard for me to judge how that's going to affect what I'm focused on. Some of the consolidation I've seen within the sectors that I work in, I think, has had some adverse effect. If you look at, for example, some of the consolidation in drug manufacturing, which I think contributes to some of the problems we see with drug shortages. Interesting. Uh, Scott, uh, watching what you've done with the agency, but also kind of watching your Twitter feed and some of your own pet projects, things that you kind of focus on and, and try to shed light on. Over the weekend, you tweeted a, a strain that was the mother of a cancer, a child with cancer, talking about how her child had been exposed to measles by just simply going to a gro shop, grocery shopping or something. And her message was one, kind of a plea for parents to vaccinate their children. What happens uh, when you don't? How important is it for vaccination? How much of a pet project is this for you? 
Well, it's not a pet project. I mean, this is a public health mandate for the agency and for the CDC and the government more, more generally. And vaccination rates have actually come down. If you look at what's happening right now, vaccination rates around the flu vaccine for kids is actually coming down a little bit. Um, if we're looking at the current data, and this is a real problem. I think people um, becoming fearful of vaccinating children um, based on information that I don't think is accurate. Um, if you look at some of the data around childhood vaccinations, these are some of the most carefully studied products on the market. And the purported link in particular between uh, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella, um, and, and pertussis and some of the other childhood vaccines and, and you know, allegations that they could potentially cause autism, that's been one of the most carefully studied questions in scientific history, modern history, and I think it's been thoroughly debunked. I and mean, we, we very carefully study that question. So people should have confidence in these products. That doesn't mean they're risk-free. Um, there are risks associated with any product, but the risks are exceedingly low, and the risk-benefit uh, for vaccination weighs heavily in, in the direction of, uh, of vaccinating your children. Measles outbreak, I know, I know it's in New Jersey and other places. Is there rising incidences there of is, measles and, outbreak? And it's tragic because this is, first of all, it's a terrible childhood um, disease. Um, highly contagious, one of the most contagious infectious diseases. And it was largely vanquished. And now we're seeing a resurgence of it. And, you know, if you don't vaccinate a certain rate of children within a community, you create the um, situation with which that could spread, where you can have local epidemics. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing happening in certain communities. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it's communities where people should, people know better and they have access to good health care and they're making a conscious uh, decision not to vaccinate. What can the FDA do about that? Well, I think we can continue to talk about what we do, which is look at the safety of these products and try to reassure the public. When, when there were questions around the MMWR vaccine, um, even though the science was shaky, we invested tens of millions of dollars in studying that question with some of the largest studies ever conducted both retrospective epidemiological studies and prospective studies to thoroughly debunk that question. I think that was an important exercise to give people confidence, but we did that. We have that information and people still aren't acting on it. They're still not uh, thoroughly reassured. I think because a lot of folks are too cavalier in propagating these sort of conspiracy types of theories that these vaccines are associated with the risks that they're not. Thank you so much for coming in today. We always appreciate seeing you.